if I had, if I, if there has ever in the whole history of popular music been such a thing as a great DJ, which I would dispute, but this is the man. The nearest thing, yes. Alan. It's true. Would you say that John had an influence on your musical taste? A absolutely. I, I used to do uh, Pick of the Pops on a Sunday afternoon, and John would follow me, and he had all these mates in the studio, you know, with, with the beards and the long hair, and, the, and I thought, what a lot of weird With the hair. <laughs> and they used to look at me, and they used to think, poor sad little man. <laughs> And uh, I used to, the moment I finished Pick of the Pops, I would, because uh, I lived about 15 minutes away from the BBC studios, I would dash home so I could listen to John and what he was doing. But I must say, Michael, I think there are two great names in disc jockey. One is Alan Freed, the American disc jockey, who, who gave us rock and roll. Uh, the other here is Mr John Peel, who I think remains the pioneering disc jockey in this country of all time. God bless you, Peely. You're a silver tongue right. devil. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. <laughs> now, you become, as Alan said, a talent spotter, but in more ways than one. In 1970, you gave a Glasgow band its first national airtime, the Humble Bums. The lead singer is working in Australia tonight. You might recognise him. The reason I'm here, mate, is to say thank you very, very much. From the bottom of my heart, thanks for getting behind us when I was in the Humble Bums in the late 60s, early 70s, you've no idea how it felt to have your nod of approval. And just standing talking to you was great when you admitted to being a rocker in your early days. I was such a happy chappy. Thanks for Teenage Fan Club. Thanks for the cure. Thanks for the disease, John. A Grateful Nation salutes. Thank you, Billy Connolly. Apart from the noise of football crowds, the roar of the bikes at the Isle of Man TT races is music to your ears. Yes, and we hold a lap record of sorts, don't we, John? It's Andy Kershaw. <laughs> <laughs> So, Andy, this is thrilling stuff. Uh, yes, well, bear in mind that the quick men now in the Isle of Man are going round the circuit 38 miles long in 18 minutes, and they're averaging 123 miles an hour. I think the first time John came over, Honda lent us a 1,000cc race replica bike, a missile of a bike, <laughs> for me to take him on a lap of the course, show him round, you know, because he didn't really know much about it. But this was only on the condition from John that I must go no faster than 30 miles an hour on this bike, <laughs> which was capable of 160, 150, 160. So we set off on this thing, and as I say, 18 minutes for the, the, the quick men there. Our lap record, the slowest of all time, is 3 hours and 24 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> but from a broadcasting point of view, the greatest broadcaster on the BBC, and by definition, therefore, the greatest broadcaster in the world, you've culturally enriched a nation. I think your own epitaph ought to be, too daft to live, too nosy to die. <laughs> Andy, thank you. <laughs> Liverpool continues to be the centre of your world and an old Scouse pal of yours finds himself on your show with this number. He'll drink a drink a drink to Lily the Pink, the Pink, the Pink, the saviour of the human race. For she invented medicinal compound. Yes, a haunting melody, I and from the scaffold, <laughs> it's John, John Gorman. Yes, You're absolutely. right. <laughs> oh, a present. Terrific. And your oh, most favourite king of all time. Yes, what a great man he was, too. Yeah. I, th I think my, my most poignant um, memory for John is Parc de Prince, 1980. Yes. Liverpool, wow. Liverpool yes. versus Real Madrid, the European Cup final. Yes. And we'd flown over from Liverpool, get to Parc de Prince, and somehow that we got split up in the hotel. You went on one coach with the, the wives, I was on the coach with the FIFA officials, my, just my luck. We went straight to the barrier, and you got stopped yes, at the barrier. Yes, I did, I did. I said to Robinson, where's the tickets? He said, tickets? Said, yeah, we organised the tickets for the, the game. Where are they? I said, well, well, tickets, you know. I said, John, John, oh, no. And the wives came up the, the avenue, the boulevard, and... As Ferguson, they call them, <laughs> Those French people, which is what we say. <laughs> and then uh, Ferguson came up and they said, where's John Pierce? They wouldn't let him through the barrier because he hasn't got a ticket. Ah. Down the boulevard, 
and you're on the far corner standing outside a cafe because you're thinking, if I can't get in, I'll have to watch it on television. It's very me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so John, 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 John. And it, it was like the sun suddenly came out over France and the, the, the God got the sunlight to shine. Yes. And, you and your whole face just like exploded the, yes, the joy. Yes. And it was my luck had not changed because you ran over and kissed me. <laughs> got you back through the barrier, saw the game. The on proud, the plane, one of the proudest from, moments of my life. Was, yeah. Except meeting me now. Except meeting you yeah. now. Makes course, two yeah. proud moments yeah. in your life. Couldn't be better. Thank you, John. My Thank pleasure. You. Now, how did uh, a Radio 1 DJ contribute to the setting up of one of the country's biggest business empires? Here's the man who knows, Richard Branson. Well, hello, John. If it hadn't been for your pioneering over the last 20, did I say 30 years, um, numerous new bands who are now internationally well known um, would never have had a chance of um, having their music played on the radio. Um, bands like, uh, for instance, and one, one, one artist dear to our heart, Mike Oldfield, uh, when you stuck your neck out and played the whole of Tubular Bells, uh, I think that's what broke Mike Oldfield. And from Virgin's point of view, I think you know, if, you ha if we hadn't broken Mike Oldfield, I think Virgin may not have been born. So um, we have a lot to thank you for. Anyway, have a lovely evening. Um, best of luck to you. If John Walters is there, say hello and see you soon. Thank you, Richard. Well, so to the <laughs> well we'll, we'll say hello to him now, your BBC producer, John Walters. <laughs> John, you produced the show for, what, 22 years? Yes, 22 years, and, and I must say quite sincerely that it's been a privilege to be associated with you for all that time. You never because... told me this before. No, so. well, I didn't say it. Yeah, we never shook hands before. I don't think so. No. <laughs> Physical contact was out. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Because I genuinely believe that you're the most important individual in British rock music, in the history of that music. Because generation after generation, this chap had spot the trends, spot the individuals, and give them all the encouragement and all the exposure he could give them when nobody else wanted to know. And the main thing was because he's got young ears. I and mean, he's still got young ears. I mean, if this bloke ever achieves puberty, <laughs> the rock business is finished in this country. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's happening now. Pulp, they go around the world, they sell probably millions of records. When they were unknowns, this bloke had them on in 1981. That's true. Did you say, where are they now? In the top ten album chart. Let's all meet up in the year 2000. Won't be strange when we're all fully grown. Two o'clock, parking fountain down the road. I never knew that you'd get married. Well, now let's hear from uh, more up-to-the-minute bands that you like and encourage. Here's The Fall. I hear you telephone thing, listen in air. I hear you telephone thing, listen in air. They're playing Manchester tonight, and Mark e. Smith talks to you from there. Hiya, John. Oh, you're having a nice night. Uh, it's Mark from The Fall here. Um, <laughs> just uh, want to say, you know, you're the only one in 79 who took any notice of us. And, um, when we're a four-piece uh, cabaret band, and I'm um, still having trouble, but I uh, <laughs> hope you have a nice night. And I think the thing people forget about you is that, you know, everywhere you go in the world, Brazil, anywhere like that, you're still one of the most famous sort of uh, British radio TV personalities. <laughs> and I hope you have a nice night. I'll see you. <laughs> now, just for you, the wedding present. She comes from the beginning. I see her face. In her space, oh, I want her. She kind of wants the flying saucer right inside my hair. Nothing can stop us now. And he's here, lead singer David Gedge. David, you two met in the early 80s, right? One of the first times I actually 
press one of my grubby tapes into your panels. We did a, a disco in Ilkley, and I travelled up from Leeds to uh, to come and see you, and uh, eventually you plucked up courage, and you actually. I think more interested in how I was going to get home because I think the trains had all finished, all the buses. And you said, How are you getting back? And I said, I don't know actually, I've never thought about that. And you said, oh, I'll give you a lift. And I said, oh, You can't give me a lift, you're going the wrong, completely the wrong way. And, and in the end, you actually got me in your car, you sent me all the way home, dropped me off my door. And, uh, what a kindly old man. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I've forgotten that. No, I, forgotten. I don't think I ever even. Well, I didn't forget it because I think obviously you're a brilliant presenter, you're very important in British culture and pop music and stuff. But to me, Ultimately, you're a great bloke, and that's that's more important than I think that now. So, <laughs> thank you, David. What can I say? <laughs> now, Billy Connolly proved your talent spotting skills aren't confined to pop music. You were the first to sing in praise of this new comedian. In person, Paul Whitehouse. Oh, wow. John wrote about you in the press, did he? Yeah, he did. Uh, after we'd mercilessly lampooned most of uh, John's mates over there. <laughs> I've got to go and sit there in a minute. <laughs> uh, we left him alone and we did a show called The Fast Show, which was largely ignored by most people. Apart from Peel, and he wrote mercilessly every week in his uh, column in the Radio Times about how wonderful this show was. And it got so embarrassing, I had to ring him up and tell him to stop. <laughs> uh, but he didn't, and I'm very pleased to, that he didn't. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> One more thing, John. When he'd finished filming, your old Dallas pal caught a plane. It landed safely at Heathrow, and a fast car has brought him here to see you for the first time in 30 years. Ken Dow. Hello, my friend. How are you? How are you, John? I'm doing well. How are you all doing, man? John Peel. What's the matter? He looks the same now as he did then, whereas I don't. I mean, no. I, you've seen the pictures, and you, you look... Uh... But he has all the money, Michael. True. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got the book, and it's now yours. Well, what can I say? John Thank Peel, you know, this is your life.